So I'm Daniel Darabos, and this is Janos Maginet. We are from Lynx Analytics to talk to you about how neural networks see social networks. Uh, first, a few words about Lynx Analytics. We are an um, analytics solution provider, I guess, mostly for telecommunications and banking and uh, well, some other clients as well. And uh, our specialty is uh, graph data. So we do a bunch of social network analytics where the data is a call graph, people calling each other, or transaction graph in a, a bank case. But we have even had uh, use cases where the graph is a public transportation network. And uh, one of the analytic tools that we use is graph convolutional neural networks. Uh, we gave a talk about those last year, but uh, I, I will give a brief refresher in case you missed it. Uh, but, but the focus of today's talk is about uh, two techniques that uh, help address a, uh, a very common concern about neural networks, which is that you train a neural network, it gives uh, very good predictions, you are happy, but uh, like you are felt uh, left out, you feel left out because you, you don't exactly understand how the neural network does it. How, where do those predictions come from? And uh, yeah, the, you, they say it, it's like a black box. You don't know how it works in, internally. And these two tools that uh, the two of us will present are ways to open up this black box, I would say. So first, uh, the refresher on graph neural networks. Um, well, it's the second day, so you've heard all about neural networks, but yeah, so a neural network, it just uh, takes an input, which is a, a fixed length uh, array of numbers and produces a prediction based on that. So it's good for problems where, you're in, where it's possible to phrase your input as a fixed length numerical array, right? But uh, in many cases that is not true, such as graphs, or, or uh, such as uh, sentence translation, or um, voice recognition tasks. So in, in those cases, well, in, in these uh, sentence and voice recognition cases, the problem can very easily be phrased as a, where the input is an undetermined length of uh, sequence of fixed length uh, numerical arrays. So each character in the sentence can be represented as a, a feature vector. So recurrent neural networks are used for processing this sort of sequential data where you, you do multiple steps. In each step, the neural network takes um, the current element of the sequential input and its current state and produces a new state and then takes the next element and the, the current state produces an even newer state. And it just iterates through, eats up all the, the input sequence and produces a prediction. So we can use something like this for graphs, but, but not just directly. So a, a graph cannot be represented as a sequence. But what we can do is uh, put this sort of recurrent neural network in each vertex of the graph. And instead of uh, giving us input uh, mm, the, the element of the sequence, instead, in each step, the input for this recurrent neural network is the combined state data from the neighbors of th that vertex. So you can think of it as in, in each uh, iteration of this procedure, um, every vertex communicates its uh, state to the neighbors. And then through this communication, they can arrive at some prediction. And, and to seed the whole thing, we initialize the, uh, the state at the very first step with the vertex features. And, and if we know any labels in advance, then that also goes into the state. And so the prediction at the end is, is based on not just the, the vertex's own features, but uh, on the features in its neighborhood and bigger neighborhood. Mm, yep. uh, for more details, see the talk from last year. Uh, the only thing you need to understand today is that it's a neural network and it, uh, the input is the features of the vertices and the, and the edges, so the structure of the graph, and, the, and that it gives very good, accurate results on benchmarks and, and since then on, on real world tasks as well. And uh, yeah, uh, we have fixed a bunch of bugs, so now the bar would be even higher on the uh, which side is that right hand side? Okay. So let's look at the examples we are going to use. 
Normally, you have some complete real, real data set and you train your neural network, you get some predictions, and if you keep part of the real data as a validation set, you can calculate accuracy, recall, what have you. When you're trying to find explanations for why a neural network is doing something that it is doing, uh, real data might not be the best candidate because it's often noisy, there might be no clear, clear, clear rules. So we came up with a couple of synthetic examples that we created the rules for and, and we knew, know the rules for. And we are measuring attribution and feature visualization on those. So we, can, we, we know if our examples work, then we can gather some explanations or real data as well. One of the examples is the three friends example where each vertex has to have at least three rock star friends that are directly connected to him. And you can see here that the center vertex is a positive sample because it has three rock star friends that are displayed as golden spheres with pedestals. Uh, the friends of the friends example is where each vertex has to have a rock star at at least two distance from him. So the center vertex is a positive sample, but the friends of the rock stars are negative. Or the direct neighbors of the rock stars are considered negative. The real, one of the real data sets we are testing against is age predictions on a social network where we divided the, the ages of the people into four equal size buckets. The other real data set is, again, a social network where we are trying to predict the gender of the people. Yeah, thanks for introducing these examples. We will use them for both feature visualization and for attribution. Uh, for attribution, Janos will be back to talk about it, and I will cover feature visualization. So in, in this, uh, for, for this tool, the question that it answers is, uh, uh, you, you want to see a, an example that's uh, automatically generated for, based on just on the model, an example for or, uh, one of the classes. Like you want to see in an image recognition problem, image classification problem, it could be that uh, you want to generate an example that maximizes the probability of a certain class, like uh, let's pick dogs and uh, we want to generate a, an image that is the maximal dogness. And uh, how it works is you, you start with some random noise as the input, random data, and then you do backpropagation. Normally backpropagation back is used for training the neural network when, uh, where the weights of the network are modified along the gradients. But in this case, we leave the weights alone and we modify the input data instead along the same gradients. So this, this allows us to use just the gradient descent uh, to get to an input that maximizes the class probability. And, but it, and you can immediately see that it, it, it gives a sort of funny example, but it's also, it also tells us something about the model. It tells us that the model identifies dogs by their eyes, their noses, the pattern of fur. So uh, yeah, we thought it would be useful for uh, graph neural networks as well. And, um, we did the following. We, we pick a, a small uh, complete graph and, and initialize the features randomly. And then we do the back propagation, adjust the features to move towards uh, that class that we want to see predicted. And we also adjust the adjacency matrix. Adjusting the adjacency matrix means um, uh, taking away or partially weakening or taking away edges from the graph. So we end up with a, a smaller uh, graph that is a good example for the class we want to see. So uh, let's see on the benchmark problems. How does it work? For the friend of friends example, uh, I was super happy when I, I got uh, these examples out of this program because, yeah, it shows that it works. It, it generated an example where we want to maximize the prob positive label probability for the, um, for the vertex in the red circle. And, and to do this, just based on the model, it had to generate an, an, an example where uh, there are rock stars two steps away. And yeah, it's a correct example. There are five rock stars two steps away. 
um, another example. So yeah, it, it's generating good examples for this. I was happy about it and tried it on the three friends example. And yeah, it generates some good examples, but then I, I kept running it and, and I got a bunch of not so good examples, right? So what is going on there? Um, it turns out this is uh, due to edge normalization, which we do because it improves accuracy on real world data sets quite a bit. But, but what it does is uh, like uh, it's based on the idea that if you have, yeah, if you have 10 million uh, neighbors, then just the, the, the effect of one of those on, on you is uh, supposed to be less than if you only have three neighbors, then, then the effect of each one of them is, is greater on you. So we um, sort of like divide with the number of neighbors. So, so the, the architecture that we have, it, it sort of, uh, it finds it very hard to distinguish between having a single neighbor or that is a rock star or having three neighbors that are all rock stars because in both cases, 100% of your neighbors are rock stars. So it's, it's hard to distinguish those. Okay, but uh, yeah, feature visualization, at least we can say it works. It, it just, uh, it identified a weakness in the model and we are actively researching cures for that. Uh, I tried it on the real world example and look at what I got. When I, when I got this, I was like, okay. I, I cannot do this talk, we, we failed. Because yeah, uh, this is such an obvious example. Uh, I immediately, immediately understood what's going on. But yeah, feature visualization works. It's just that the, the, the easiest example for being in a certain age class is that you have a single neighbor and that's in that age class. And then we are 100, per, no, we are 99.2% confident that you are also in that age, age class. It generates, uh, uh, like, because it's initialized from a random state, um, I get a variety of examples, but uh, most of them fo follow uh, the same pattern. Like, okay, in this case, we have even higher confidence. It's an even stronger example. Yeah, because edge normalization is not, uh, not as simple as I described it, but yeah, uh, it's, it's an even better example in that sense. Uh, but it's still boring. I, I cannot uh, come here and talk to you about this stuff. So I, I went searching through uh, 100 examples or something. And, uh, and yeah, thankfully, there are a few more interesting examples. I picked one. Um, in this case, OK, it's uh, a bit of uh, the same. So it's, um, it has four immediate neighbors in the same class that we are looking for. But then it has uh, seemingly another layer of indirect connections that are in a different age class. And then a, a third layer with a single vertex in that. So I was uh, worried that maybe this is just an artifact of feature visualization. Like it, it's just, uh, so it's not just the result of optimization, maybe it's just noise. So one way I thought to verify this is I, I started taking away these vertices. Oops, sorry, wrong button. So I, I take them away one by one, and I was looking at the confidence value of the prediction. And thankfully, I saw that uh, the confidence starts to go down. So actually, yeah, actually this is uh, something that is real in the sense that the model really thinks that uh, having this second layer, it increases the confidence, right? So, and, and the model was trained on the real data. So this is, it, it probably picked up on this pattern from the real data. Yep, all of them come. Um, what is this good for? Well, uh, like you see, it, it allows us to discover something, some patterns about the real data that we would never have known about without feature visualization. Like this interesting two layer structure. Mm, if you just look at the data, you never notice it. And uh, understanding the user behavior better, it has obvious uh, uh, benefits, yep. But uh, as you saw in the three friends example, it also allows us to uh, find examples that uh, mislead the model. So it, it's a kind of a stress test. I also like feature visualization as a debugging tool. When, when you are working on figuring out the uh, architecture of the neural network, like you are considering changes or something, it, it's very useful to be able to see uh, not just uh, the end results, but uh, dig deeper. Like uh, um, feature visualization can be done not only for the final output layer of the network, but also for intermediate internal hidden layers, right? And, and you can see what each hidden layer is responsible for. Which, what concepts uh, is it working with? 
uh, also um, the training process. Like if I see uh, a loss curve, I'm doing the training, waiting for it to finish, and I see that the loss curve goes down sharply at some point, or it goes up sharply at some point uh, in unfortunate cases, then I can, I can use feature visualization to see what it was thinking before the change and after the change, and, and I get an impression of what did it learn at that point in the training. And the super imp interesting case is where uh, we can use this to um, start not from a uh, random state, but from a real state. So in that case, it, it, it produces really actionable answers, like uh, uh, maybe the model is predicting that a user is going to cancel their subscription in a, with high likelihood. And of course, we don't want that. So we can, we can use feature visualization, or at least the same algorithm, to um, optimize the input so that they, they fall into the other class, into the class of people who don't cancel their subscription. And, and uh, the difference between the, the, two, mm, the two inputs is, is a, it tells you what would need to change for them to not cancel their subscription. Very, very actionable. So how about attribution? Is it good as well? So that's the second method we are using to gather model explanations. The image processing parallel is that we have a picture, we have a label, that this picture is a dog, and we are trying to find out why the neural network predicted that this is a dog. And the way we do this is using the integrated gradients method where you start from an empty baseline, you get the, re the actual input, and you gradually move towards the inputs through many steps, and you add up the gradients on every step of the way. The way we do this for graphs is, yeah, you take an empty graph, and, and you move towards the actual input, and you add up the gradients at every step. So for the three friends example, we can see that the rock stars have the highest attribution in the network, and the baseline vertices, the gray, spheres have, are much smaller than, than the rock stars with the high attribution. The friends of friends example is even more clear that, that the size of the rock stars attribution is greater than everything else in the network. So now we know that this attribution works. We can find out which were the most influential vertices in the network. Let's go on to the real examples. There are trivial examples like we've seen from feature visualization where the ma majority of the neighbors are from one H class, then probably the vertex we are trying to predict for is in that same class. And what our network does differently than classical methods is that it's, it, when there are special samples of communities, it's still does correct predictions, like it all outperforms classical methods such as the most frequent neighbor. How does it do that? So we, here we can see that, that the network predicted a counterintuitive label for the target vertex on the right. Um, it, it's connected to a community of a completely separate age class and that those vertices in that community has the highest attribution in the network. Okay, there are vertices with the same age class that have high attribution, but the large majority of the attribution came from the community of these young people. So this could be, for example, a teacher that has students as his neighbors. For the gender predictions, there are also some trivial examples, like here, the Vertex was predicted correctly as a female because most of their friends were female as well. And the attribution sizes show us that it was predicted to be a female because of the female neighbors. But here also there are examples where we do something more. Uh, here the target vertex was predicted to be male. Actually, there are more female neighbors. It might not be obvious from the image, but there are lots of na female neighbors with small attribution. So what, what we've seen here is, is there is this community of four people that are 
contributing more to the prediction than others. What's going on there? We've done quite a bit of investigation, and what we came up with was that these four people have a very low clustering coefficient, which roughly means that these four people go to very separate communities together. They could be working together, and they could also go to conferences together, or they could be parts of completely separate friends group, friends, friend groups. So that's probably why our network predicted correctly that vertex to be male. So what we can use this attribution for is debugging the model first. Like if we have a wrong prediction, we can find out why it happens. Or we can do explanations for the model where instead of just having a prediction that, OK, this person is going to leave our company, we can find out, OK, this person is going to leave our company. And that's because his friend left as well. And we can give that information to the customer rep representative, for example. And another thing we can do is that this mass attribution data set can be analyzed to gain even more customer insight. And that's it. Thank you. All right, we've got some time for questions. Uh, if you have a question, please come up here to this mic. Um, so the visualization, are there libraries in TensorFlow or Keras that make that easy to do? And the second question is, um, I, I, I were you able to do this with LSTMs or recurrent neural networks? Oh, yeah. Uh, for the recurrent neural network, we now use uh, GRU, gated recurrent unit. It's similar to LSTM, a bit, a bit faster, I think. And, and uh, Were you able to do visualization on that like you did with the convolutional neural networks? where you were able to um, control the linear or the, the, the gradients to, uh, to look at it and uh, see what features were relevant for that uh, node. Were you able to do that with um, GRUs? Yeah, well, in these examples, there's always just like one, one feature. So um, yeah, it, it would be more interesting in, on a data set with a ton of features. Good point. OK, and is there a library? that uh, lets you do that visualization with TensorFlow? Or did you? Uh, yeah, uh, the visualization is done with uh, Paul Ray. It's an open source ray tracer. And oh, no, not that. Oh, I'm which, talking which about the, the first part of your, your talk about how you. Uh, oh, no, I just clicked that together in uh, Google Slides. Right? Uh, well, let's talk. This one? Yes, yeah, sorry. Can you clarify a little bit what the friends of friends example was? Is it that there has to be a special friend two away, or can it be one away? Or how does that work? So the each vertex has to be directly exactly two. connected to a vertex that that's connected to a rock star. So you cannot have a rock star as your direct neighbor. I see. Because there's one of the visualizations you show uh, of this example. Most of the weight was on the two away. Or I guess the, the so-called rock stars, but there was very little weight on the intermediate one, which seems to me a little bit yeah, weird. Because right. You'd expect the intermediate one to be the thing that actually enforced the constraint. Yeah, we, we did ex expect that, and and we were surprised when we didn't see that. But then uh, we realized uh, why we don't see it. We don't see it because uh, in this case the feature goes from zero to one, and uh, very high values mean you're, you're the rock star, and. Uh, the way attribution works is you start with the baseline and, and slowly iterate toward the, the final values. But the baseline is all zero. So until you so add the, the special ones. So is it, is it zero until you add the, the rock star? Maybe I'm not understanding how the incremental part works here. You don't add it vertex by vertex, but it does have higher that when, when you reach the point where, where that vertex becomes relevant, it 
gets high attribution. But yeah, yeah, attribution is uh, affected by how you pick the baseline. Like uh, in image attribution, also if you had an image with uh, mm -hmm. where the important thing is black, mm -hmm. you would uh, see very little attribution on it because it's very close to the baseline. So it's, it's a matter of choosing the baseline cleverly. And uh, in this case, we, we decided it was fine like this. But yeah, in some cases, it would make sense to pick a different baseline so that we can see that Yes, this, this vertex needs to not be a rock star. And, and then it would have a high attribution on it not being a rock star. But in, in this case, we just have uh, the, yeah, the not rock star is the baseline. OK, thanks so much. Thank you. Thanks. Do we have any more questions? All right, if not, let's have another round of applause for our speaker. <laughs>